Welcome, everyone, to the lecture. Uh, my name is Chris Brader. I'm from the FDA, Division of Neurology Products. And uh, this will be about my fifth year giving this lecture. I thought if I changed the cover slide, I'd get a bigger audience here. So uh, we'll see if anyone else walks in or if we get sold out here. So, and I'm sure you all think it's sort of strange going to a lecture on project management. There isn't going to be any, no pathways, no restriction enzymes, no, uh, no gene sequences. And also, a lot of you were probably wondering, you know, why am I spending my, my valuable time to listen to a, a lecture on project management? And I hope that I convince you before the end that this is probably the most relevant lecture you'll ever go to for your career because as you ascend the ladder, even in science, um, everybody becomes a manager. And really, if you're on a team at all, you know, you're, you know, you're sort of a project manager within that for yourself. So uh, I, I hope everyone gets something out of this lecture. Uh, since I'm from the FDA, of course, we disclaim everything we're about to say, and it doesn't represent the FDA in any way. So as a matter of introduction, and I present this just so you know that the lecture you're going to get is really not just the viewpoint of someone from the FDA. I've actually spent more years in industry than I have at the agency. And I also am in academia. I teach also at Hopkins. So I think you'll get a very well-rounded perspective here, having not only a regulatory perspective, but a, a business perspective as well. So by the end of this lecture, it's really split into two halves. The first half really talks about what project managers do. And I would invite you to think about yourself and your supervisor or boss and think about whether they have these characteristics. And then the second half, I'll present something about tools used in project management. And I do that because in one of my positions where I was managing people and projects, you know, I realized that the tool, there were certain tools I had that really made the project, made it much easier and allowed me to be very effective. So it's become a, an interest of mine. So, um, just to show a hand, who here has a position, and I guess I'm talking to thousands on the, on the uh, stream as well, who here has worked in the pharmaceutical industry? Anyone? So not a lot of people. So that's why I always start this at a very basic level, but I think that once you see what I'm presenting, it's not so mysterious what goes on in the pharmaceutical industry. The one thing I'm sure of, though, is that who here has a boss? Does anyone have a boss or a supervisor? Right. How many of you have ever had a bad boss? Right. So very important then to understand about managing, managing projects. I'm sure if you're in a lab, you know, you work on projects. You know, projects are in every industry. So maybe if your boss isn't that good, you can teach them a little something about how to manage things. So first, I want to show you a little peek under the hood of what happens in the pharmaceutical industry for those of you who haven't, haven't worked in one before. So this is my perspective on the pharmaceutical development. It's really like a, a wheel that's continuously moving. And what energizes that wheel are uh, unmet medical needs from patients and innovation in the R&D sector, as well as uh, market potential. So here you have the scientists and the business folks. You know, if there was no other constraints, you know, they would be <clears throat> working together, you know, trying to develop things. And uh, but there are constraints in the industry, and the first is resource limitations especially if you're in a very small company. Let's say you got your first seed amount of money. It's about $40 million. That sounds like a lot, um, but it's really not. And that can really 
tailor what sort of activities you're going to do. And then another constraint you have to live with are regulatory constraints. Um, and no one likes to be really constrained, but if you consider the trial that just happened recently, where 90 people went in the trial and at least one person came out fairly brain dead, the French trial that's been in the news, you know, that's why we have regulations. So things like that may not happen so frequently. So it's really a, a very dynamic tension between the innovation that goes on and both the resource and the regulatory constraints. Um, left to its own devices, it would just spin without friction, but, some, but you definitely need to deal with these other realities. And so what does a pharmaceutical project team look like? Well, in its simplest incarnation, um, the drug is really the center of the team. Everything focuses around the project. And then you have certain specializations, like some people are known as the clinical folks, mostly MDs or sometimes PharmDs. Then you have people who specialize in regulatory issues. You have chemists who uh, the bucket they're in is called CMC, manufacturing and controls. And then what's known as non-clinical. Those are pharmacologists and toxicologists and all. But it's not just four people on a team. Um, oh, I should have mentioned the business people are on this team too. Sometimes, you know, the scientists would like to keep them in a little cage, um, but they can be very present on this team. So at the first level, you can see there are actually a lot of sub-teams within those teams. And I don't know if you ever, anyone heard of the shampoo PERT? Does anyone remember PERT, that thing? I told two people, they told two people. You know, pretty soon, just the clinical team alone is huge. I was on one drug development team in a meeting that had several hundred people in that meeting from that team. Uh, so these teams can be very big. And as even with small teams, you know, you get a lot of very smart people together. Everyone wants to do things their way. It can be very difficult to manage that. And the team structure is something known as a, a matrix team. And um, a matrix team is one where, for example, your direct supervisor really doesn't direct your day-to-day -day activities. It's really either a project manager or a team leader. Um, you go back and report to your direct supervisor, but the, you know, the person who gives you your schedule of the day is typically someone else who doesn't really have direct control over you. And the expression is that person needs to lead you by influence because they don't really have a, you know, a direct control over your performance uh, evaluation, even though they may give their opinion. So. It's, you know, you're beginning to see here that the ship is controlled by someone who's not really allowed to grab the steering wheel. It all needs to be influence and their sort of business and behavioral skills that's going to lead this massive army, you know, in the development project. So as I mentioned, you're going to have lots of people on this team, lots of ideas, and change is going to happen very frequently. Most drug development projects go anywhere from five to 15 years. So, you know, many things change. The people change. Usually the people you go on a team to start with are not the same as the people who are gonna make it to the end. And one thing about very smart people, they have a lot of ideas. And just like your Microsoft platform in Excel, sometimes you're gonna get changed just for the sake of change. So there's gonna be a lot of stress in the team, and you need someone to manage all of that, what's going on. And is it, if that wasn't hard enough, you have many internal forces in a project team. I'm sure you know also from your, your lab. Um, you have uh, behavioral relationships. That's the team I put up top. And time is a factor. You're on a deadline. Um, you know, maybe your project fell out of favor with the management, so for no reason at all, that could be cut off because it may not make as much as the other person's team and you have no control over that. And then there's external forces, right? Other companies, uh, activist groups now, if you 
listen to the news, activist groups are very involved in, in pharmaceutical development. There's reimbursement issues, Congress. I had a boss who got summoned in front of Congress about a drug we were working on. It's not a pleasant experience. Um, the agency is in your face and other companies, of course. So a lot of external forces, a lot of internal forces. So there's a lot of pieces moving on a team and a lot of people. So you need someone to really keep order of all that. Um, I have an expression that I say about teams in that more behavioral disorders have killed drugs than toxicology issues. And actually I teach a course at Hopkins that has a simulated drug development experience and typically the team that does the worst is the one that has the most behavioral issues on it. And the team that didn't appear to have such a great background or didn't have all the self-proclaimed geniuses, but they can get along with each other. They actually seem to do best in the course. So um, it's really the mastery of all these soft skills that are very critical. So now that I've sort of introduced you to what pharmaceutical project managers do, we'll talk a little bit about their job. First of all, project management is defined as uh, what you see on the slide here, you're expected to meet or exceed the needs or expectations, the stakeholders. Who do you think the stakeholders are for a pharmaceutical project? Any thoughts on that? Who could be stakeholders? Investors, right. They can be kind of demanding, I would think. Who else? I sort of mentioned them before. Someone up there? Patients, right. Activist groups, patients' parents, if you work in a pediatric area. Also, um, right, so investors, the company, um, lots of stakeholders. Uh, so project management teaches you the skills, how to recognize all these stakeholders and what their needs are. So... This is a trivia question I ask that no one gets right, so I won't drag you through it. 27,400,000, what do you think that represents? That is the daily cash profit from the drug Lipitor, all right? Like 10 billion a year if I did my division right. Um, so the, actually the guy who used to teach this course before me, who was one of my mentors said, and he only used a million dollars. He goes, if you cost your company a million dollars because you delayed something by one day, you think you're still gonna have a job? It's like, nope. So when the drug makes 27 million, the pressure's even higher. So that's why you need very good management. Each drug, well, I don't think every drug costs about 900 million to develop, but. Uh, some of the more complicated ones can get up there. Uh, there's also what they call opportunity costs, and that is the time and money you spend on this drug you don't spend on the other drug. Um, and as was mentioned, the patients are, are waiting. Patients really know what's going on these days in terms of pharmaceutical development. Um, so it really behooves the company to manage well. This just graphically demonstrates it. I think you can tell I like images. So first one is your stock plummets, money goes down the drain, and patients are left waiting. If you do, if you manage good, you keep things organized, et cetera, you'll have higher, what they call net present values. You'll be able to get more products out. One of the goals of the team is not so much developing the drug, but killing the bad drugs. Um, that's as important as letting the winners win. Um, and also, you know, I should probably strike this from the slide since I'm from the agency. I think a more organized program may tend to get a faster regulatory review, but I'm sure there's no guarantee of that. And the situation has actually uh, become increasingly 
difficult over the years. In this slide, uh, it shows, for example, the drug Inderol, a beta blocker. When it was developed in 1968, there was 10 years before the competitor came. Now, this slide is only as data from 1992, but what it shows is that your competitors there are going to be on your heels in less than a year. And in fact, you know, I would say in the late 90s, most drugs, like I was in the antipsychotic uh, drug field, all those drugs were developed at about the same time. So everyone's really neck and neck. So what does the project manager do? So some historical notes. When the, when the job description first came out, the project manager was generally just someone who took notes, who sat there in the room, didn't comment too much. Uh, but as they started to track resources, money and people, they, you know, information is power. And uh, they became more and more important to the to the development exercise, to the point now, if you look at the very top, where they're key members in deciding what the portfolio of the company looks like, and often involved in a corporate venture exercises. So they've really become an active part, not only of the drug development team, but of the executive management of companies. Still, most of them uh, in their project management roles, you know, have to do both project analyst duties. In other words, they need to keep track and keep organized, things like timelines and budgets. Uh, but also, in many organizations, they're seen as project leaders or voices to the upper management. I worked in one company where uh, you could tell what someone did by what floor they were on. It was a private company. And the family that owned the company, let's say, was on the ninth floor. The only other people on the ninth floor were the heads of project management for the major projects. So that's their recognition that those people are sort of the eyes and ears for the, the executive board. Really what they do is a combination of uh, business. You need to be a master of business as well as uh, interpersonal skills. Um, and I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail. These are some of the skills that you need in the job. Uh, certainly, most project managers aren't the topic experts on a team. Um, sometimes the clinical leader is also the project manager on, on some teams. But Really, the project manager's job is to facilitate things, facilitating decisions. And even though they're not the topic experts, uh, the ones with a lot of experience, you'd never know they didn't have a degree in you know, pharmacokinetics or, or any part of clinical research because they have a very deep background and they see where all these things fit with each other. Uh, as I've mentioned numerous times, you know, being able to interact with humans is uh, very important. Knowing what it means to be a leader, how to keep your team uh, working together is very important. Uh, knowing how to communicate is absolutely essential, not always just agreeing with someone, but knowing how to sort of nag them just enough to get the, the best job done. Here's a little communication joke. And then tools, which we'll talk about at some depth. Uh, most project managers, especially the ones who have this license, it's called PMP, it's like a test that they take, are very good at these tools. I think the one that most people are the weakest on is probably the one you're the weakest on in your everyday life, and that's budgets. Budgets are very difficult, and they're a little harder in the pharmaceutical industry, because every time there's a change, you may have to do, for example, a five-year budget. So a project gets killed, redo the budget. Um, you're thinking of merging with someone, redo the budget. It's very challenging. 
so. So I think the, the take home message from this part is really that you know, the, the so-called soft parts of project management can be the most important, your interpersonal skills. It's not always the most sort of brilliant by the book person who's gonna do very well. Um, you know, it's really someone who's very organized, who really has a sensibility about people that's gonna do very, very well in this job. So now I'll stop for a second. Are there any questions? That's the first half of what we'll talk about. That's sort of the soft behavioral part. Any questions about that or the job? <clears throat> I have to say that um, either project management or a regulatory person seems to be the most common thing that people coming out of college or with some level of scientific background, that's, those are the entry sort of jobs for most people that I see in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so it's something worth considering. Uh, project managers can actually rise very well in a company. I've seen them go up to chief operating officer uh, from your Joe Average project manager because they're exceptional with people and they really know how to get, the, get jobs done. So, all right now, tools. Um, as I mentioned before, I include this in the lecture just from my own experience because you know, I noticed in myself that there were certain tools that really helped you be organized and really propelled the, the projects forward. So I'd like to share uh, some of that with you. And the most, oh, and even for those of you who are not on a team, you actually are on a team, you can use these tools for yourself. You don't need to be on something called a project team um, because almost every project that you do for yourself, it's this level of organization that people tend to notice and may really you know, propel your own career. So for my purposes, one of the most useful tools I found was something as simple as the team meeting minutes. And um, what they are is a very, very well organized progress review. They're the basis of communicating with senior management who as you might suspect is quite attentionally um, deficient. So the more you can boil things down, the more simple things are, uh, the better they're looked at. They're a good place to document uh, what they call accountabilities and responsibility. Um, most people have a hard time telling someone they have to do something or you are definitively responsible for something. But when it's written down and everyone in the company sees that, it, it sort of makes it easier. And also it's a good way to drive the agenda of a meeting, something many meetings go on with no agenda. You could sort of see them floating around like that with no real direction. But the team meeting minute sort of starts with the agenda and everything else gets filled in as you have the meeting. Um, just for a template, there's a concept known as issues, which seems like a simple word. Uh, but in this case, issues are very specific things. These are things that will cause a delay or cost you more money, something that's really gonna worry your boss. All those go in, just like a drug label, a black box up top, all right? Because you really need to sort of put it in people's face. Um, anything that impacts what they call a go, no go decision, uh, which is you get to a certain point in a project and if it's this level, you're gonna go ahead and if it's that level, you're gonna stop. Anything that affects that point goes in that box. Also timelines, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, finances, if you can boil it down, uh, that's good to put in. And then specifically for the, maybe not even specifically, for the pharmaceutical industry, as you could see from the first slides I put up, there are a lot of departments. And so it's good to break things down at the very end by department so people can go to their own area 
and see what's important. All right, the next one is something known as a target product profile. Has anyone here heard of a target product profile? So it's funny, I worked in one company where I got the same sort of response. They got a new head of development and no one had ever heard of a target product profile. Unfortunately, that person wasn't the most articulate and so it took about a year or so before anyone really understood what a target product profile is. So now when I teach clinical development, I always put this in because it's a very important tool, not just in the pharmaceutical industry, but um, it turns out in all of industry, even the World Health Organization uses them. For example, when they're thinking about vaccine programs, they, and you'll see what a, I call it a TPP, you know, when they want to develop a new a vaccine, they figure out what improvements they want, and you'll see in a second how all that gets sorted out on a TPP. Um, and actually, it's almost better to see it, and then we'll come back to the, I'll explain, you know, what I wrote down here, but until you see it, it's hard to imagine what it is. I'll actually skip this. So this on the screen is an example of a target product profile. And all this is made up. So the drug that I want to develop is uh, called, the brand name we're going to call it is Awaken All. All right, and it's for sleeping. And this is one of my course numbers at Hopkins. So, so that's one thing to know. Um, the gold standard for that particular indication is this uh, drug. Let's see if I have a... I don't think I have a mouse that's working. The drug in the column, don't snooze and all. So, for example, if it was headache, you know, I could be developing some form of naproxen. The gold standard might be aspirin. And that gold standard could be from either a market perspective, who sells the most, or from a technology perspective or performance perspective. That's really a conversation between you and your business folks. The leftmost column in the target product profile are what I call attributes. Those are things that you can uh, plan for. They're characteristics of a drug, right? So the frequency of a drug is important in terms of its, uh, its appeal for patients, right? A drug you need to take four times a day, not as attractive as when you take once a day. Um, there's something known as a food effect. If you eat a hamburger with the drug, some drugs, the drug concentrations go way up. Um, the size is important. Some pills, especially antibiotics, very big, hard to swallow, especially if you're elderly. Um, there are even intellectual property aspects you could talk about. Uh, maybe you want, you could do it, you know, many ways to make the drug but one way has a type of bead that has an intellectual property advantage. So that might be something you wanna build in. Uh, you also put in expected efficacy parameters as well as safety parameters. Now the difference here between safety and tolerability is safety is things that gives rise to warnings or precautions um, and tolerability are more the side effects that you know, people decide on their own, make them want to take a drug or not. Um, I actually, in your slide deck, I think you can see a number of flags here. And what I do with these flags is I point out how each of these attributes, um, you know, if you're trying to develop a competitor for the gold standard, you know, how you could improve on each of these. Now there are different columns also in the TPP, and to start with, the base case is what you realistically believe the drug will perform like. And it's, it's very hard to predict these things, but people who are very used to doing it come up with uh, parameters or metrics that are pretty reasonable. But for my, for my sake, the most important column is the one that says low case. 
the low case is the column in the target product profile such that when the drug's performance falls below that line, you're willing to kill the whole project. Remember I said it's important to know how to weed out the losers, etc. Well, this is the first place where you sort of you make a contract with the company's management that you're going to do everything you can to develop this drug. Once it crosses below that line, you know, the drug has to be killed. And even though it's, it's sort of your drug, you know, it's actually better for you to kill something that, that isn't what you want than to keep pumping money and resources into something that's not going to be successful. So for example, the low case here is BID, meaning twice a day. Um, that isn't so hard. Food effect, you know, I don't want a drug with any food effect at all. Well, if it turns out that the maximal concentration of the drug is increased, um, you know, after a, a high fat meal, um, I need to think, you know, is the efficacy gain I'm getting, you know, good enough such that I've crossed over the go, no go, you know, does that sort of cancel it out? Um, it's not so black and white as any time you cross over, the drug gets killed. You know, if it cures pancreatic cancer, you're not going to care if the drug concentration goes up a little. But if the efficacy is just about what you expected, but it's very low on some other key parameters, for example, tolerability or safety, then you might kill the drug at that point. So this is what a target product profile is, and it really it's the thing you create. It's very simple. One page before you come up with a, what it would be the clinical development plan. And then that ultimately translates into the labeling for the drug. Everything you want in the labeling should be factors that are present in your target product profile. Because if you didn't think of it back then, you're not going to do a trial to get the data to support it in your labeling. Anyone have questions on target product profiles? Oh, wait. I think you need a, a mic. Oh, okay. Can you say it a little louder? I'm just asking, where would you put together the table? Like, Great. Ah, oh, thanks. That's actually a great question. Um, Let's say, here's what the flow, if you go to, I give a lecture here in Clint Farm about development programs. The first thing that typically happens in a company is hundreds of molecules get synthesized. And then you have different criteria, and one of those gets thrown over the fence to go into humans. Once that drug is synthesized, you can't do anything about it. All you can do is study it, right? But if you think about this beforehand, you can say, um, for example, I don't want an antipsychotic that has uh, so much you know, weight gain issue. And back then, the theory was that you know, that was tied to histamine binding. Well, if you know that, you can do receptor binding assays as you're screening there. So the answer to your question is, before you pull out a jar of chemicals, um, the best situation I've ever been in is, you know, the clinical person, the business person, the non-clinical, and the chemistry person get together and do this. And that sort of thing leads to a, like a first-rate project because you've thought about what you wanted. You know, as much as there is a possibility to control things, you know, with the chemistry and the type of molecule, you know, that's your best chance, because once you have a molecule, you're stuck with it. All you can do is characterize it then. So that's a great question. Any other questions? All right. I think now that we talked about it, so let's go back just for a second. So just again to what it is, um, the business people take all these factors, you know, for each of the cases, low, base case, and high, and they'll figure out what the value of the drug would be based on those different scenarios. Um, 
as I mentioned, this also forms the basis of the go-no-go -no -go criteria. And also, uh, as I mentioned, this will be the basis of the clinical development plan and the, the drug label, drug labeling, that sheet of paper that has two-point font on that you've seen with all the information about the drug. And perhaps most importantly, the major bullet is that it's a contract between you, the development team, and the management of the company about you know, what they want. Have you ever done something for someone and then they say, well, I didn't exactly want it like that. I want it like that. Has that ever happened to you? I'm also a, a Eagle Scout advisor. I was on a project once that involved planting trees. After like 12 trees got planted, the guy who signed the thing that said he wanted 12 trees planted came out and said, I didn't want them there. I wanted them over there. So this target product profile, when you're talking about $900 million, it's good to know where the trees should go, right? Um, so it's a contract with you and the company. Well, I should mention, I, I just flew by it. Let me see if I can get it. There's actually a guidance for industry from the FDA on target product profiles. It's almost a different thing, the target product profile you present to the agency, but it has a lot of similarities. There, like the other situation, you say basically what you want in your labeling um, and what you're going to do to study it. Um, and then the agency kind of comments on whether it's credible to get a labeling like that and exactly what you would need to do to, ach to achieve that. So enough on TPPs. You might have seen on one of the slides, I had the phrase draft label. So the guy who used to teach this course before, he was actually vice president of project management for the team that developed Celebrex. You know, his teaching was that the drug company doesn't make a drug. What the drug company makes is the product labeling. Because the product labeling is what allows you to do advertising, uh, which we all wish they didn't do advertising, especially when you go home for dinner. Um, and it instructs the physicians on how to give the drug and tells people about what their concerns need to be. So the project labeling you know, is extremely important. One thing people do is, uh, before the final label, they mock up a draft label. And that's based on the attributes in the TPP and the clinical development plan, as well as the data that's continuously coming in. And you're always updating this draft label as the drug gets developed. So it's actually, the draft label is a tool for the development of drugs. It's a very dynamic document. This is just some detail on what goes into labeling. As I mentioned, uh, it really is the basis for advertising claims. It's the information for doctors and consumers. And as I mentioned, if you want to talk about it at all, it needs to be in your label, which means you need to study it. A lot of people think something is self-evident. They don't need to study it. They just write it in the label. If there's no data for it, nothing is self-evident. Sometimes you get things in your label that you didn't study and you don't want, though these things are called uh, class labeling. For example, the warning about uh, suicide for antidepressants is a, is a class labeling. So pretty much if you develop any antidepressant now, it's going to get that class labeling. Or the warning for uh, diabetes with antipsychotic drugs, even you know, if your drug looks very good from a blood glucose or a incidence of diabetes, you're likely to get that, that labeling. So another tool, very important, I mentioned this earlier, is a strategic development plan. Strategic development plan is at a corporate level. The clinical development plan is a component of that. The strategic development plan uh, has an executive summary, of course, 
because you want your attentionally deprived management to uh, be able to swallow this. And even in this, uh, this is from a book I'm going to show you at the very end. It's probably the best thing to read if you're interested in project management. Second thing they put in was the target product profile, the business strategy, the clinical strategy, regulatory. Every division makes up their own plan. You know, the chemists, and then the science, and then at, at the very end, the budget stuff goes into this. It's from this book I'm going to talk about at the end in case you're interested. Um, something known as a Gantt chart. Has anyone here ever seen a Gantt chart? You know what this guy's name is here? It's actually Mr. Gantt. He's from Maryland, so a bit of pride here for the hometown person. Gantt charts, and it's a little hard to see because it's small. Uh, the actual definition is it's a tool used for, for uh, showing the relationship of resources. So what are your resources? Well, the, the most obvious from here is time as a resource. Most people don't think of that. It's probably your most valuable resource. The other resource you have is money and people. So you can use your Gantt chart to show you know, where you need to allocate money and people and what the, you know, what the relationship of all the projects is. All right, each of the major phases is one of these black bars, and then the, th the projects that go on within that are these hatched bars, and you can see these arrows that show once you finish one, which project starts next. And on the left, you can see all the projects listed out and their duration. All right. Very good to write down all these things. It's like making a, a list for yourself. Um, it forces a little reality into the situation. The phrase I like is that it allows recognition of critical interdependencies. You know, it doesn't help to get to the point where you're ready to start the clinical trials if you have no money to buy, you know, the scaled up drug. So you know, you better have, you know, $15 million before the phase three, otherwise the clinical folks are just going to sit there. Um, another phrase that's tied into all this is something known as critical path. Um, criti what critical path is, is it's the series of projects that are really defining the timeline, okay? Things can't get done until project A gets finished, you can do all these other things during that. Those are called off the critical path. Um, but everything's waiting on A to finish, and then a new thing picks up the position of the sort of rate limiting step. Uh, so that's known as critical path. And this just shows um, on a larger view the uh, the light gray things are on the critical path, whereas the open boxes are not. And you can see that the light gray things line up, you know, end to end, really defining the timeline of the project. And believe me, your management, you know, if you slow down one of the open box things, it's not good. If you slow down a critical path item, that's very bad. So you never want, first of all, you never want to be on the critical path sort of a game we had of forcing other divisions onto the critical path. Um, but once you're on it, you never want to delay your project. It's probably the only critical path cartoon on the internet right here. And then the last tool I'll talk about is uh, one for risk management. When you're in project management, you're constantly thinking about if I continue with this, am I wasting money? Um, what's the likelihood of succeeding? You know, what am I giving up by going ahead here? Uh, it's called technical probability of success. And this diagram shows for each of the phases of a drug development, right? Preclinical, phase one, two, three, um, 
what the probability of success is, what the cost is this net present, or what the value of the asset is at that time, and then um, you know, what the cumulative probability of success to get to the very end is. And so people very good at project management, along with the rest of the team, especially people who've done this a lot, can pretty much you know, figure out these, you know, the percent of success or failure getting to each step. And it helps you know, planning a portfolio uh, to know, you know what the likelihood of succeeding is. So there's a whole science in how this is done. All right, so I'm just about finished. Um, this is the book I mentioned to you. If anyone's really interested in project management, this is uh, Kennedy's Pharmaceutical Project Management. There's a whole series of books that have this red cover on in most libraries. Um, this is actually, the, there are two editions to this book. This is actually the first edition it really differs from the second. You could tell he was sort of writing this from the heart. I've pointed some statements out that, you know, for someone who's done this, really sort of hit home. You can really tell that Kennedy's been in the, in the trenches, you know, doing pharmaceutical project management, which makes it very enjoyable to read. And you can actually buy the first edition separate from the second one. Um, so that's what I would recommend. So in summary, I think you got from the initial slides that clinical development is very complex, both the science of it and the behavioral aspects. The clinical development project manager plays a very pivotal role in that job, and they have various tools at their disposal for organizing um, and for communication. One thing I didn't really stress is that, you know, beyond having the title of project manager, really the project leader of a project I've found is anyone who really takes the reins. It's actually the name of this painting right here. I've seen teams where the project manager was a, an MD. I actually had one where the project manager was the medical writer, because that person had seen so many projects go through, they had the clearest head as to you know, what should be going on when. So it, it really is whoever takes the reins and moves the project forward. So with that, I'll conclude and take any questions. Or not. All right, stay dry. <laughs>